It's late at night and you're feeling sleepy. As you tuck into bed, you start getting drowsy and slip off into a deep slumber. But suddenly, instead of a pleasant dream, you find yourself in a dark, steamy boiler room. And standing in front of you is a familiar figure with a black fedora and bladed glove. Do you stand a chance against him? That's what we'll find out in this episode of the Infographic Show, You vs. Freddy Krueger, Could You Defeat Him? Freddy Krueger was a normal family man with a loving family. Though under this secret facade, he was a depraved serial killer who stalked the children of his former classmates, all of whom had taunted and ridiculed him throughout school, making his life hell. Torturing and killing the children, he spread their remains throughout town and became known as the Springwood Slasher. Eventually, he was caught by the police, though a faulty arrest warrant saw him released on a technicality. The town took justice into their own hands and burned Freddy alive in his boiler room. Though as he succumbed to the flames, he was approached by three dream demons who offered him the power to stalk and kill through dreams. Accepting, Freddy became a dream demon himself, empowered by fear and gaining power by absorbing the souls of his victims. So, say you find yourself face to face in the middle of a nightmare with the fabled dream demon Freddy Krueger. How could you defeat him? The first strategy will be to remain awake as long as possible, as Freddy is powerless in the real world and can only strike at you from within your own dreams. One good way to stop yourself from falling asleep is the use of amphetamines such as Adderall or Speed. As a stimulant, amphetamines speed up messages traveling between the brain and body, and taken in large doses have the side effect of making it very difficult to go to sleep while retaining a decent amount of energy. If illegal drugs aren't your thing, you can try legal drugs such as Modafinil, or perhaps just take your chances popping caffeine tablets. However, too much caffeine in your system can lead to irregular heartbeat and seizures, and staying awake for too long can lead to serious mental disorders such as paranoia, depression, hallucinations, and even psychosis. So, you're staying awake via a steady stream of caffeine pills or a few hits of amphetamines every few hours. What now? Well, your first tactic could be to try to find Freddy's remains and have them blessed by a priest. As Freddy still has the soul of a man, he is technically being possessed by the dream demons and as such, vulnerable to a rite of exorcism. It's not as easy as just sprinkling some holy water on a bunch of burnt bones though. Due to a rise in the demand for exorcisms in recent years, the Vatican recently held a week-long conference to address the rising tide of exorcisms and discuss concerns over the uneven skills of the Vatican's current exorcists. The church warns that would-be exorcists should apprentice under an experienced exorcist and the risks of conducting an exorcism while unprepared can be dire. Perhaps, though, you can use the threat of exorcism to lure Freddy into the real world. As a dream demon, Freddy has no more power in the real world than you do, and luring him into reality or forcing him into it will completely take away his powers. However, be warned, he may not have supernatural powers anymore, but he is still armed with a very dangerous glove full of razor-sharp knives. You can try and take Freddy out one-on-one -on -one with some karate skills, but we recommend instead something far simpler, a Smith & Wessel Model 629. Armed with a 44 Magnum round, the 629 is a highly portable and extremely powerful sidearm carried by many American hunters for self-defense against bears in the wild. Capable of creating an exit wound several inches wide, simply follow the old shooter's adage, two in the chest and one in the head and Freddy will be no more. But suppose you accidentally fell asleep and Freddy lured you into one of his signature nightmares. What then? The best and simplest defense against Freddy is actually quite simple. Don't be afraid of him. As a dream demon, Freddy is un able to harm his victims without first cultivating an aura of fear. Freddy accomplishes this by haunting his subjects for weeks, gradually building a sense of dread within them that empowers him. Once the fear has grown strong enough, it's a simple matter for Freddy to kill his victim. So your best defense is to simply not be afraid of him. The best way to overcome your fear is six tricks used by military veterans around the world. Number six, prepare and practice. By mentally preparing yourself for your confrontation with Freddy, you can diminish the fear once it actually goes down. Per US Navy SEAL Platoon Commander James Waters, Navy SEALs spend 75% of their time training for a deployment and 25% of their time on the actual deployment. Once in the midst of a confrontation you've been preparing for, you'll naturally slip into a state of preparedness, greatly reducing fear. Number five, laugh. A Stanford University study revealed that people who were trained to make jokes in response to disturbing images dealt with them in a much better way than those who didn't. Laughing can also release feel-good chemicals such as endorphins in the brain, further lightening the mood and decreasing the fear. Maybe try picturing Freddy naked, or on second thought, maybe not. Number 4. Breathing 
Fear manifests itself physically with a racing heart and pouring sweat. You can fight these physical manifestations by lapsing into a pattern of very deep breaths. Inhale for 4 seconds and exhale for 4 seconds, calming your nervous system and putting you back in control. Number 3. Voice in your head We've all experienced the nagging voice of doubt deep in our brains during stressful times. In moments of fear, that voice can become amplified and completely override your own thinking. Tell it to shut up. Mentally shout over these thoughts like many soldiers who shout words like faster to themselves in order to shift their focus from the fear. Number 2. Worst Case Scenario Much like the first tip to prepare and practice, imagining the worst case scenario that can happen can mentally prepare you for the emotions that you're bound to experience, lessening the intensity once they actually manifest. So picture Freddy ripping your guts out. Imagine what it would feel like to have those 6 inch long blades of his in your soft flesh. And then, when the time comes to actually confront him, you'll find that the fear you're facing is kind of familiar and easier to overcome. Number one, push your comfort zone. Fear typically comes from experiencing the unknown or dangerous. A simple way to defeat fear then is to constantly push your boundaries and expose yourself to unknown and dangerous circumstances. Just like exposure therapy can combat phobias, exposing yourself to more and more scary things can actually lessen the effect that fear from any source can have on you. So you're not afraid of Freddy anymore. Perfect. Now you're in control of the dream and Freddy can be your plaything. While dispatching him in the dream world isn't a guarantee that he'll stay gone, if Freddy can't make you afraid anymore, odds are he's not going to be coming back anytime soon. Although we still recommend the Smith & Wesson. It's a late summer's night, and you and your friends are out camping by the lake. As you're laughing and joking, suddenly you hear the snap of a twig coming from just beyond the small circle of dim light your fire creates. Nervously, you laugh it off as a squirrel or other small animal, and get back to horsing around. When suddenly, one of your friends gurgles a dying breath as a machete splits his head open. Looking up, you see a 7 foot tall figure step out of the darkness and retrieve the machete. It's him. The legends were true. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, where we pit the average Joe against the legendary Jason Voorhees. Could you defeat him? Jason Voorhees was born in the small town of Crystal Lake on June 13, 1946. Afflicted with hydrocephalus, which created several facial deformities, an abnormally large head, and mental mental disabilities, Jason's mother, Pamela Voorhees, kept him away from other kids and took care of him alone at home. Having no other people in his life, Jason developed a deep bond with his mother, loving and revering her above anything else. In the summer of 1957, when Jason was 11 years old, Pamela was unable to get a babysitter for Jason and brought him with her to Camp Crystal Lake, where she worked as a cook. Hanging around his mother instead of the other kids, he was inevitably ostracized by the other children and eventually bullied for his disabilities. One day, as he was being bullied, Jason fled from the kids, who chased him to the end of a dock. Throwing him into the water as a joke, the kids watched helplessly as Jason began to drown while the camp counselors who were supposed to be supervising the children were having sex in the woods. Jason's body was never found, but the camp was closed as a result. Opening the next year, Jason's mother Pamela, mad with grief, murdered the counselors she blamed for Jason's drowning. Unbeknownst to Pamela, Jason had somehow survived his drowning and built a crude shelter for himself where he stayed for years alone. Jason would ultimately rediscover his mother 20 years later, but only moments before she was decapitated by a new camper acting in self-defense. Taking his mother's sweater, pants, severed head, and the machete that killed her, Jason built a shrine to his mother and began his murderous rampage. So let's say you're foolish enough to go camping in the area around Camp Crystal Lake. What can you expect to go up against? Well, first of all, be warned, because Jason and his mother both blamed his near drowning on teenage promiscuity, any drinking or sexual act are surefire ways to be marked for death by a vengeful Jason. So keep it in your pants and you might survive. But let's say you managed to stumble across Jason anyways. What should you be prepared for? First of all, you should be aware of Jason's superior strength. Already a hulking and imposing figure, Jason stands at nearly 7 feet tall and easily weighs over 200 pounds. But his strength is far beyond that of a normal human being, able to bend even metal pipes. Jason is also incredibly durable. Though not impervious to damage, he has shown great resiliency, even taking a machete to the head and surviving. After his accidental resurrection by a lightning bolt, though his resilience reached supernatural levels, with Jason apparently being completely impervious to any fatal damage. That's not to say that Jason can't be hurt. 
It's simply that killing him can be nearly impossible. The last thing to be aware of is Jason's incredible speed and stealth, seemingly able to cover vast distances in surprisingly little time. Some theorize that Jason simply has the ability to teleport to shadowed, hidden areas near his prey, as when observed physically walking, he is typically no faster than the average person, and yet routinely surprises and ambushes fleeing prey. So how can you survive an encounter with Jason? The first tip would be to remember that even though he is in fact extremely resilient, he is not invulnerable to damage. While after his resurrection by a lightning bolt, Jason seems to be immortal, it has been clearly demonstrated that Jason can be restrained for years in one location, frozen solid, or even blown up into small bits. Your first order of business will be to slow Jason down. Despite his resiliency and slow regenerative powers, Jason clearly still takes damage. With Jason's far superior strength, a melee weapon such as a club or an axe is completely out of the question. You're really just asking for a machete through the skull. You need to keep your distance, and you need to dish out some serious damage that will slow Jason down. Here is where you want to be thinking much like you would in a zombie survival scenario. But forget the headshots, which are difficult targets to hit anyways. Firearms deliver tremendous amounts of kinetic energy at very high speeds, and whether you're an undead zombie or an immortal machete-wielding mass murderer, a shattered femur is still impossible to stand on. While gut instinct may be to go for a popular shotgun, we recommend going instead for something with much more penetrative power. Your goal, after all, is to hit structurally vital bones and obliterate them. An M4 assault rifle, favored battle rifle of the US military, can deliver a 556mm round at 2970 feet per second. And with a steel penetrating core, a few shots to the leg is sure to decimate Jason's ability to support his body weight on that lip. But don't stop there. The backbone is extremely important structurally for an upright bipedal animal such as a human, helping support the upper body and distribute that weight evenly to the pelvis and thus the legs. Put a few rounds into Jason's backbone and shatter his backbone to watch him crumple over like a sad pancake. It's important to remember that Jason can regenerate though, so he won't stay down for long. You may be tempted to take this opportunity to run and hide, but given Jason's ability to seemingly appear from out of nowhere, this is probably not a great idea. Instead, keep Jason in full view at all times and let him crawl towards you. If he regenerates, no problem, put a few more bone-shattering rounds into his vital areas and slow him down again. While you can't kill Jason, it has been shown that you can obliterate his mortal form and force him to return to hell until he reassembles his body. So what you want to do is carve Jason into pieces, but again, while staying out of reach of that terrifying machete of his. Enter the M18A1 Claymore Directional Anti-Personnel Mine, another favorite toy of the US Armed Forces. Unlike a typical mine, the Claymore is aimed at a target and fired by remote control, shooting a pattern of 700 3.2 millimeter steel balls at a speed of 3,995 feet a second, a maximum of 250 yards. With a detonator made out of 2.5 pounds of C4, the closer you lure Jason to your hidden claymore, the better. And you'll have to lure him, because another thing Jason has shown is that he's not dumb. So if your claymore is out in the open, forget about it. He's not falling for it. However, if you successfully lure him to within range of your hidden claymore, be sure to get him as near as possible while you stay safely out of the firing cone. You also want to be somewhat cautious about backblast, although thanks to the Mizne Chardon effect, where a sheet of explosives has its blast directed away from a heavy backing surface, such as the Claymore's rear metal plate, you shouldn't be in too much danger yourself, aside from possibly shattered eardrums. However, for Jason, being on the business end of an exploding Claymore is going to ruin his day as 700 steel balls absolutely shred his body. Jason will come back. He always does. And to be sure he doesn't regenerate right away, we recommend you spend a few hours picking up the meatball-sized pieces that are probably all that's left of Jason's body and perhaps burning them. You can try and appease his spirit by giving his ashes a proper burial near his mother's final resting place at Camp Crystal Lake, but in all likelihood, it's probably just better if you put up a bunch of signs and get stupid teenagers to stop driving to the site of multiple mass murders to make out. Strolling through a flea market in a faraway land, you come across a peculiar stand selling what seems to be puzzle boxes. You begin to toy with one, amused at its ingenuity, but soon your eyes land on a particular puzzle box kept in a glass case behind the counter, far out of reach of curious grasping hands. Asking the vendor about the peculiar item, his eyes light up as he looks you up and down for a moment before smiling, an act that leaves you rather unnerved. The vendor agrees to sell you the box at a deep discount, telling you that you're the perfect customer for it. 
Taking the box home, you begin to fiddle with it and discover that pieces of it can be moved around and reconfigured. Suddenly you've solved the puzzle and the box leaps out of your hands and rearranges into a brand new configuration. And then from the darkness in the corner of your room you hear the rattling of chains and the deep moaning of something horrific. Standing before you is the fiend of pain and pleasure, the legendary Pinhead, along with his host of Cenobites, and they have promised that your suffering will be legendary, even in hell. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics U Versus. Today we're putting you up against the Leviathan's chief architect of pain, Pinhead. Pinhead was once a man like you and I, albeit one tragically scarred by the experiences of World War I. A soldier serving with the Allies, Elliot Spencer witnessed the horrors and carnage of trench warfare, horrors that sucked the joy of life out of him. His mind broken by the atrocities he had seen, he became disenchanted with life and in a desperate bid to feel something again, anything, he engaged in a globe-hopping expedition to seek out every form of carnal gratification he could think of, and yet he still hungered for something more. Eventually he discovered the Lament configuration, a puzzle box designed by a brilliant engineer over 200 years ago and infused with dark magic. When properly arranged, the box opens an interdimensional portal to the realm of hell, kingdom of Leviathan. Dragged into hell, Spencer was subjected to every pleasure and torture imaginable, and eventually transformed into the Cenobite known as Pinhead, when his soul and that of Sipe Toktek, a Mayan prince, merged together. So you've accidentally summoned an interdimensional entity who's now hellbent on flaying the skin from your flesh while torturing you with every possible pain and pleasure in all of creation for eternity. How are you going to defeat it? First, you have to know your enemy, and the most important thing to remember about Pinhead is that despite his appearance and his origins in the dimension of hell, he's not in fact a demon. Pinhead is instead a Cenobite, a twisted abomination created by the merging of Captain Spencer's and Sipe Totek's souls, and then infused with living flesh. This is an important distinction to make, because while true faith can be a powerful weapon against a demon, it's going to be completely useless against Pinhead or his Cenobite cohorts. Holy water and other holy artifacts may be deadly against a demon, but they won't do anything against Pinhead, save for very quickly getting you horrifically maimed. As for powers and abilities, Pinhead has quite a few tricks to call on. First, he's very resistant to physical damage, not completely immune, but highly resistant. Because Pinhead manifests physically in our world, he's bound like any other entity that takes on corporal form by the rules of the prime material plane. That means that Pinhead can be shot, stabbed, and even exploded. Although, as mentioned, he does have incredible vitality and is supernaturally difficult to physically hurt. Plus, there's the simple fact that Pinhead can deal with pain extremely well. He has spent a hundred years exploring every pain and pleasure imaginable. His body has been tortured in every way you can think of, and his mind has evolved to turn pain into pleasure. Hurting Pinhead isn't going to slow him down much, and while he sticks a few chained hooks into your flesh, trying to return the favor is only going to get his rocks off, so to speak. The chain hooks are another thing we should bring up as they're definitely one of Pinhead's favorite weapons. Pinhead has the ability to tap into the Well of Midnight at any time, manifesting its malevolent energy as iron chains tipped with barbed hooks. The chains are frequently used to string up victims and immobilize them in preparation for transport to hell, or in preparation for their eternity of suffering. The chains can also be used defensively though, with Pinhead calling upon them to shield himself from attacks of other supernatural beings. They can bind a target completely, lift them into the air, or simply strike from multiple directions at once to tear flesh and wear down a target from blood loss and pain. It seems that Pinhead feeds off his victim's sufferings, and so the more he can inflict on them, the more powerful he becomes. Lastly, Pinhead has an almost omnipotent ability to know every emotional and physiological problem you've ever had in your life. He knows of every disappointment, every tragedy, and every moment of abuse you've ever suffered. He understands exactly what will hurt you, the most psychologically or emotionally, and sometimes his torture is not physical at all, but rather emotional. In fact, some of his victims are dragged to hell not to suffer physical tortures, but rather to endure emotional and psychological tortures, forced to relive the most horrible moments of their lives, or thrust into nightmare possibilities where they live through horrifically traumatic events over and over into eternity. 
It's not clear, but it's believed that eventually when a victim's soul has been thoroughly defeated this way, the victim is eventually turned into a Cenobite under Pinhead's command or operating on their own to perpetuate human misery. So how are you going to take on the Prince of Pain and Pleasure? With its ability to know what hurts you most emotionally, conjure chains and hooks out of thin air, and to resist most physical damage, this isn't going to be an easy fight. First, your mind is your best weapon, only in this case it's Pinhead's best weapon. He's a patient guy. He doesn't need to come swinging right out of the gate and rip you to shreds with his mystical chains and hooks. Instead, Pinhead will haunt you from the shadows, calling upon your worst emotional and psychological traumas. Perhaps he will force you to live through some of these memories all over again, all with the purpose of breaking down your will. This strengthens Pinhead, and some victims can be so defeated that they simply give in to the physical torture that comes next. So you're going to have to make sure you've got a good grasp on your noggin. If something haunts you from your past, let it go. Take some yoga classes and do some self-help therapy. Vent out your most painful experiences with a professional who can help you sort them out. That's not just good advice on insulating yourself against Pinhead's manipulation, but it's good advice for daily life. So you've made peace with your inner demons and now they serve you instead of Pinhead. That's one big step forward in this battle royale. Now it's going to come down to fisticuffs, or well, not that, because you really don't want to get into a boxing match with a guy that has sharpened pins all over the face you'll be punching. Next up, you're going to want to find a way to protect yourself from Pinhead's primary weapon, those flying chains with the nasty little hooks on the end. Pinhead's going to be wanting to stick those everywhere on your body, and we do mean everywhere. So you'd best not give him the chance. You're going to want to get your hands on the Chainmail Sharkproof Suit from Hamahar Slimmer designer of shark-proof suits for underwater biologists for the last four decades. The suit features a fine weave stainless steel mesh along with the helmet. The suit sleeves, bottom of the tunic, and boots all extend under the upper layer to give you double-layered protection in several vital areas. Rated to withstand a shark bite short of a great white shark, the shark suit will make you pretty much invulnerable to Pinhead's dreaded chain attacks, and at only $7,500 it's quite a steal. The suit does leave your face exposed, however, but a simple medieval style face mask made of steel will take care of that problem. With your full body suit making you impervious to Pinhead's hook and chain attacks, and your iron will making you equally impervious to his attempts to manipulate you emotionally, this just leaves the problem of actually defeating Pinhead. As we mentioned, Pinhead is extremely resistant to physical damage. Even the most powerful assault rifles aren't going to have much effect. Cenobites are only seriously injured by other supernatural beings, and even if you manage to say blow Pinhead up, he'll simply reform back in hell and come back later to finish you off. You don't want to give him that opportunity, but you also can't kill him, and you don't want him escaping back into hell until you eventually really have to pee and take off your chain link shark suit. Once more, we're going to turn to science, only this time it's the science of magnetism that we're turning to. Pinhead's head is embedded with dozens of metal pins, and it's well known that his body is host to many, many piercings, some of them in very uncomfortable places. We think it's time to turn Pinhead's love for heavy metal back at him, so you're going to have to get your hands on a junkyard electromagnetic crane. Naturally occurring magnets aren't powerful enough to lift up huge slabs of steel, but wrap an iron core with wires and run a current through, and voila! You can create a powerful electromagnet that can lift cars. For you though, you're going to use the electromagnet without the crane. Simply bury the magnet in the floor or perhaps inside a wall where you'll be summoning Pinhead. And when he arrives, let him do his hooks and chains thing for giggles. Remember, you're safely sitting inside your shark-proof suit. When he's worn himself out trying to rip you apart, simply press a switch to run the electricity through the magnet, and voila! The metal in all of Pinhead's piercings and pins will trap him up against the magnet, rendering him completely helpless. What you do from here is, well, kind of tricky. Pinhead doesn't need to eat and drink, and you can't keep the magnet on forever because the electrical bill will bankrupt you in no time at all. Plus, if there's ever a blackout, well, you're going to have one very pissed off Pinhead coming after you, and the odds are you won't be in your shark suit when he does. So we've done it before when you were fighting the evil doll Chucky and we'll do it again. You're going to have to transport Pinhead to the bottom of the sea, somewhere that nobody can stumble across him ever again, and set him free to torment humanity once more. As usual, our supernatural evil dumping ground is going to be Litki Deep in the Arctic Ocean, which reaches a depth of 17,881 feet, 
Just chain Pinhead up nice and tight and dump him overboard. If you remember from our You vs Chucky video, we chose this spot because there's very little chance of any fisherman accidentally snagging one of our evil villains with his nets and dragging them back up to the surface. With Pinhead safely in the bottom of the ocean for a few hundred years minimum, you're free to finally hop out of your shark suit and take a breather. However, if you've been following along in this series, then you've probably already dumped Chucky down there too, in which case you should probably always be cautious about what goes bump in the dark around you. There's no telling what the lead Cenobite and an evil murderous doll may get up to if allowed to plan together. One day you're sitting at home playing video games and stuffing your face full of pizza, when suddenly your world goes black as a rag full of chloroform is thrown over your face. The next thing you know, you're waking up groggy and confused, and as your eyes adjust to the dim lighting, you're horrified to discover your body strapped up to what looks like an elaborate torture device. From out of the darkness, a small ventriloquist dummy pedals out on a tiny tricycle as a pre-recorded voice says, Hello, do you want to play a game? Today we're pitting you, the average Joe, up against Jigsaw, the demented serial killer from the Saw franchise. First, this isn't going to be like a typical deathmatch, because in the end, Jigsaw is nothing more than a sick old man, and even the average Joe would have a pretty good chance of just clobbering him to death in a fist fight. Instead, we're putting you right in some of Jigsaw's most famous traps, and we're going to help you figure out how to escape intact so that you do in fact get a chance to clobber the brilliant but demented engineer to death. So think you've got what it takes to beat Jigsaw's games? Let's find out. Jigsaw thinks you've been wasting your life due to your video game habit. You stuff your body full of soda and pizza while rotting your brain with video games and being cruel to strangers all while pretending to be a tough guy on the internet. Jigsaw wants to know just how badly you really want to live. He wants to help you realize that there's more to life than video games. But the only way to do it in his sick twisted head is to force you to mutilate yourself in a life or death struggle. First up is the oxygen crusher. You wake up with your arms held out to the sides and secured by chains, while leather straps around your midsection hold you firmly in place. An oxygen mask rests on your face and on either side of your torso are metal pistons, and you realize that you're basically inside a giant mechanical vice. Across from you is another random Joe, and a pre-recorded voice starts speaking. This game is easy. Whoever can hold their breath the longest wins. With a click, you feel the machinery come to life around you, and instinctively you gasp for breath. Big mistake. This makes the two pistons on either side of you squeeze closer together, crushing your body just slightly. You realize that the mask measures the air you breathe in, and if you breathe in too much, you get crushed to death. The goal is simple. Take a deep breath and hold it longer than the other guy. So the goal is to hold your breath. How can you ensure you hold your breath the longest? You may want to follow the advice of deep sea free divers, such as the men and women who dive 65 or more feet without the aid of any breathing equipment. The Bajau are a people from Malaysia and Indonesia who make their living diving to depths of 65 feet to collect pearls, clams, and other goodies off the seabed. From them, we can learn several tricks to extending how long we can hold our breath. First, don't hyperventilate. Many of you have probably done just this in breath holding contests with friends as a kid. The thinking is doing so will oxygenate the blood, which lets you hold your breath longer. And there is some truth to this, but hyperventilating actually just lowers the level of CO2 in your blood without increasing the oxygen level, which means you're holding your breath longer not because of an increase in oxygen, but because of a decrease in CO2. So you're in no way reaching your maximum breath holding potential. Instead, take a full deep breath that uses all of your lung capacity. Typically we breathe with only the upper part of our lungs. If when you breathe in you see your chest and shoulders rise, then you're not breathing with all your lungs. According to a free diving expert, Expert, you want to take a full, deep breath by sucking in air with your mouth, filling your lungs from the diaphragm up. Don't rush the breath though, slowly let your lungs fill until you start to feel it at your sternum. Then the very top of your lungs will fill, causing your chest and shoulders to rise. This process should take 20 seconds, but dramatically increases the amount of time you can hold your breath. The next step is mental though, and kicks in as you're holding your breath. After a certain amount of time, you'll start to feel the urge to take a breath in order to purge the CO2 building up in your system. You'll have to call upon all of your willpower to ignore this instinct to breathe, which will then lead your diaphragm to having convulsions. This is the part that's the hardest to fight though, but if you concentrate hard enough, you'll hit a point where your spleen will, as an emergency response, release 15% more oxygen-rich blood held in storage for emergencies straight into your bloodstream. Freedivers often feel a surge of energy when this happens, and is a secret to holding your breath for minutes at a time. 
So congratulations, you've survived Jigsaw's first trap and let an innocent person be slowly crushed to death instead of you. On to trap 2. After beating your opponent in a breath holding contest, you now wake up in a metal cage suspended from the ceiling. Below you are several large and very nasty looking spikes and you notice the bottom of your cage is hinged. A wire runs from a small motor and up above you to where you see a lever. An idea dawns on you. You must pull the lever which will open the cage, but doing so will drop you onto the spikes below. This is actually a simple trap to escape from and all it really requires is some pretty good upper body strength. The first thing you're going to want to do is swing the cage back and forth like a pendulum and that way when you do pull the lever and the bottom opens up, you can drop out clear of the spikes below. But be warned, because the moment you pull that lever, you fall, so you better have a good grip on the cage around you or you'll turn into a human skewer. Simply wedge your feet into the openings made by the cage's bar and pull the lever. Then as the cage is swinging, climb down, kick your legs to get the momentum of the cage going again and drop clear of the spikes to safety. As far as traps go, we're pretty disappointed with this one in the films, but it would definitely be our choice to find ourselves stuck inside of. Ok, you got out easy on that last one, and this next one may seem simple, and it is, but it's going to require that you have a very high degree of pain tolerance. You wake up in a locked room, but discover a combination lock on the door. The lock requires four numbers, and the numbers have been tattooed onto your wisdom teeth. On the floor in front of you is a set of pliers, and on the wall is a chart of the human mouth with all the teeth labeled. We think you know where this is going. First, let's all be thankful Jigsaw was kind enough to provide a handy reference chart, which admittedly is not your standard evil villain move. If it had been up to us, there would have been no chart and you'd be left ripping out teeth blindly to find the numbers. So I guess we might be more sinister than our versus subject. Ok, so like we said, this one's simple. Using the chart for reference, all you've got to do is put the pliers in place on your wisdom teeth and, well, pull. It shouldn't take much force, typically just a few pounds of pressure is enough to pop those suckers free, but it's going to hurt like all hell. We recommend you think pleasant thoughts. Some studies show that thinking of happy memories can improve a person's pain tolerance dramatically. So think about literally anything but teeth being ripped out, which might be tough to do since you're the one actually ripping out your teeth one by one. But hey, once they're out, just think about the fact that wisdom teeth removal costs on average between $75 and $200 per tooth, and if they're impacted, it can cost as much as $600. With most adults eventually needing them removed, Jigsaw just saved you a fortune. Yay American healthcare! Now you wake up suspended again, but this time from your feet. Below you is a tall open cylinder with a motorcycle sitting atop the cylinder. Instead of wheels though, the motorcycle powers a set of gears which, as the bike speeds up, begins to turn a sharpened metal coil inside the cylinder. The coil itself slowly narrows towards the bottom, but there resting on the floor of the cylinder is a motorcycle brake. The object is simple, reach out and squeeze the motorcycle brake to stop the cylinder fail and you'll be slowly lowered into the narrowing coil to be cut to ribbons. On its face, this one is terrifying and admittedly, being slowly lowered onto a cylinder with a sharpened metal coil spinning at several hundred RPMs is good reason to wet yourself, but this trap isn't particularly difficult to defeat and instead relies on overpowering your fear. When you think about it logically, the trap is quite easily escaped. The coil narrows at the bottom near the motorcycle brake you must squeeze to shut it off, yet it doesn't narrow so much as to make reaching the actual brake impossible or even particularly difficult. All you have to do is wait for the rope to lower you far down enough that you can simply reach out with one arm past the narrow end of the spinning metal coil and squeeze the brake. The real enemy here is fear, which will make you nervous and twitchy, and you don't have much room to be panicking, because swinging even just a few inches as you near the bottom of the coil is going to get your arm cut off. So calm down. Take a deep breath and let it out. Repeat a few times as the rope lowers you down. Ignore the loud sound of the machine as you're being lowered in and try to clear your mind. Then simply keep as still as you can on the rope and just reach one arm out ahead of you and squeeze the brake. Easy peasy. You're almost done, but Jigsaw has saved the best, or at least the most horrific, for last. This game is simple, and the good thing is you're in complete control the entire time. The bad thing is, well, you'll find out. You wake up in a room divided in two by metal grates. Between the grates is a large scale, and the arms of each scale are empty. One arm is nearer to you and the other is closer to your adversary, another rando victim lured into one of Jigsaw's diabolical games. On your head is a helmet with two screws pointing at your temples. The object is simple, you have 60 seconds to make your side of the scale weigh more than your opponent's, or the helmet will activate and drill the screws into your brain. How are you going to get out of this one? Behind you is a desk with several cutting implements, though they're all chained to the table so no cheating and just chucking a knife onto the scale. The implied solution is obvious. Cut off 
off pieces of your own flesh to tip the scales in your favor. However, and we did rewatch the movie to confirm these details, there is a very large, heavy cleaver made available to you. A cleaver which can easily smash through a few links of metal chain. So the first thing you're going to do is smash the chains on everything you can toss to the scale on your side. But you better move fast because your opponent is going to get the same idea. Next, you're going to toss your shoes, your socks, every article of clothing you possibly can is getting tossed onto that scale. But say that isn't enough and you and your opponent are both left standing there completely nude and about to die. What flesh can you offer up to tip the scales? Well, the victim who survives in the movie ends up chopping off her own arm, which admittedly is a pretty good way to win this game. But for us, we like arms. They're handy, pun intended. For things like waving at people, arm wrestling contests, and punching Jigsaw to death, your stomach fat is a pretty good alternative. And as long as you don't cut too deep, you should be safe from bleeding to death, at least until you can get medical attention. Plus, cosmetically speaking, this is going to affect you the least. One good skin graft and basically you'll have just carried out the world's quickest diet. You might be tempted to go for the love handles next, but be careful, that's pretty close to the kidneys and other organs, which are very allergic to being stabbed. We recommend instead you go for the butt and carve up your rump like you're making roast, because the butt is full of fat and very little of it is critical for keeping you alive. Plus, you can always refatten your butt, and with plastic surgery you can bring back that booty with a capital B. Congratulations, you did it! You survived Jigsaw's traps and can finally face off with the diabolical maniac killer who imprisoned you here in the first place. Except, no, you can't, because cancer already killed him. See, you were the winner of this u versus all along. In the first game, the Oxygen Crusher, well, that was just a test. If you had taken the noble option and killed yourself to save the other person, remember, we did tell you he was an innocent, the trap would have disarmed and you would have both gone free. Then discover Jigsaw's fate. Instead, you were selfish and now not only are you disfigured from cutting your own flesh off, but you're responsible for several murders. Welcome to another video when we pit someone or something that has extraordinary strength and abilities against a regular Joe, such as yourself. Today we're talking about Thanos, one of the most formidable bad boys in the Marvel Universe. He first showed his ugly face in the comic The Invincible Iron Man No. 55 and has since been a fairly regular fixture. You might also have seen him in a number of Marvel movies and he'll appear in the upcoming Avengers Endgame. The creator of this villain, Jim Starlin, quite amusingly once said he got the idea while studying psychology and anger management. Yep, Thanos sure has a problem controlling his rage. But now let's have a look at his backstory before we get into the actual fight. Indeed, if you look at Marvel's Cinematic Universe fan site, you'll see that he would have been interesting work for any psychologist. He's described as being powerful, extremist, genocidal, psychopathic, violent, and tyrannical. Also known as the Dark Lord, Mad Titan, or even the most powerful being in the universe. He's understandably a bit of a handful. He was born on Titan, one of many of Saturn's moons. Just so you know, according to NASA, Saturn has 62 confirmed moons, but a few more could be added to that list soon. Titan is special, as it has its own atmosphere. Thanos is the son of Eternals, Ars and Suisan, and he has a brother called Eros. He carries something called the Deviance Gene, and this somewhat helped shape his appearance. After his birth, his mother was so taken aback by his appearance that she tried to kill him. The father prevented this from happening, but perhaps some of Thanos' darker aspects can be explained by how he was treated and how he looked. He was friendly enough during his early days in school, but kept to himself and mainly just hung out with his brother and his pets. But then, as he got older, he became fascinated with death and some aspects of nihilism, a philosophical belief that life has no inherent value, purpose, or higher meaning. But then he finds meaning later in life when he becomes obsessed with Mistress Death, the personification of death itself. Chasing after her is his raison d'etre, and there is nothing he wouldn't do for her. We might also add that Thanos was not always portrayed as an out-and-out -out villain. You see, when he was living on Titan, there were way too many people and just not enough resources. Thanos had the idea just to kill half the people and the problem would be solved. That didn't go down well with his people, of course. He didn't perform the Great Call and then he was proved right. Titan was overrun and devastated, and the Titan people almost became extinct. Over his long history, the story has changed many times, but you can read in the comics how Mistress Death got Thanos to wipe out half the universe. She said there were too many living people and not enough dead people, and asked him to get the job done. Thanos believed this to be true, having seen what happened on his own planet. He thought sending off half the universe to an early grave would be an act of love in some ways. We should add that Mistress Death was also around from time to time to bring him back from what seemed like certain death. 
Thanos wants to exterminate half the universe because he thinks he's doing a good thing. That's based on his belief that there are not enough resources to go around. The simple solution is to just get rid of many beings. He commands armies and he has many followers. He seeks to find the Infinity Stone so he can succeed in his plan. If you don't already know, the stones are six elemental crystals that hold an important aspect of the universe. These stones were the creation of the cosmic entities and they each hold immense power. So for many years Thanos goes looking for these stones and that gets him into a lot of trouble while often making alliances on the way. He becomes a very feared tyrant because if he came to your planet he might see to it that he left with half the population dead. It would be an understatement to say Thanos is a hard man to keep down. He comes up against the best there are including head to head with Thor, the Avengers, the Masters of the Mystic Arts, the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Nation of Wakanda. He eventually wins in his last big fight and with a snap of his fingers the universe is depopulated. He has no misgivings, sounding at times like German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche once said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Thanos once uttered the dictum flesh is weak, weakness must be cast aside for the sake of power. For Thanos, power and sometimes ruthlessness had to be embraced for the greater good. Destruction was as necessary as creation. He even had his adopted daughters Nebula and Gamora fight and when Nebula lost he removed part of her body because he said this would make her stronger. So did this crazy tough loving tyrant ever lose a fight? Well, as some of you might know he once came up against the forces of Wakanda who were backed up by some of the members of the Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy, and he makes fairly easy work of them. This ends with the Mad Tyrant putting the sixth and last stone in the gauntlet and harnessing the power of the universe, thus making him omnipotent. As we said, the end product is Thanos achieving what he always wanted to do, get rid of half the universe. He saw this as imperative to saving the other half, but we might ask if there was an alternative solution. Thanos didn't seem to think so, kind of hailing himself as an unsung hero once saying, the hardest choices require the strongest wills. That's basically saying, it's a dirty job but someone has to do it. Thanos incurred an injury but he seemed happy enough after killing half of all beings. What we usually see in such stories is the bad guy losing but Thanos proved he had almost unstoppable power. But if you go back through all the comics Thanos had his behind handed to him on many occasions. In 2005 you might have seen him losing a fight to Squirrel Girl. While Drax the Destroyer once killed him by ripping out his heart, Adam Warlock once turned him into stone and that held him back for a while. But as we said, when you have Mistress Death in your corner there are often ways of getting resurrected. He's also been killed as a clone and even as a zombie Thanos and on many other occasions when his anger and nihilism got the better of him. What is so often his downfall is his devotion to Mistress Death and she seems at times to enjoy playing with his sometimes misguided mind and fickle heart. Thanos Thanos might be the strongest of them all, but he has an Achilles heel, his heart and ego. When people were asked how Thanos might be defeated in upcoming movies, seeing as he laid so many people to waste in the last one, a few folks had some ideas. At this point we have an already almost unbeatable villain who now has been made even stronger with cosmic cubes and infinity stones, he's been made to look like he can't lose. But as we know, everyone loses sometimes. The closest we saw him to being badly hurt in the movies was when Thor hit him in the chest with his Stormbreaker. We at least know that he has a weakness and perhaps as some pundits have said someone will rustle up some kind of weapon in the upcoming movie and that weapon will be the end of Thanos. After all everything so far has been thrown at Thanos and nothing worked. Perhaps it will take some magic from the tool makers and who knows what will be created. We looked at what people were saying on forums about how to beat Thanos and some of the answers were amusing. One person said the Avengers will have to appeal to Thanos' rather large ego, taunting him to fight them without using all those powers powerful stones. Perhaps Thanos might just do it to prove he can win, but we doubt this will happen. There's also the fact that the Infinity Gauntlet might not always wield the power that was required to wipe out half the universe. Without its full power and the fact that he was hurt, this might mean he could be defeated. As many others have said, why didn't Thor just aim for the head and not the chest? Others are not so positive, with one person writing, the Avengers essentially cannot beat Thanos with the gauntlet. He kills half the universe, regardless of power, with a mere thought. He could literally really end reality with the gauntlet. And with that in mind, 
How could you beat Thanos? Well, as you don't have superpowers and you are up against a person that can destroy just about everything in the universe, this is not going to be an easy fight. In fact, let's just forget about having a traditional fight and think about heart, mind, ego, and hubris. So let's have a look at the name Thanos and his brother Eros. If you know your Greek mythology, you'll know that there were two characters with a similar name and the same name. The first was Thanatos, the personification of death. The second was Eros, the god of love and desire. The Marvel comics just based their characters' names on ancient Greek characters. We might also note that psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud said that people are controlled by both a death drive, Thanatos, a drive toward ultimate destruction, but also a drive to create, which was based on Eros. Ok, so if we're sticking with Greek myths, we might acknowledge that Thanos is lacking in the Eros department. He's been devoted to Mistress Death, but that's almost like looking in a mirror. Perhaps your only chance of defeating Thanos is to teach him to love, to show him love. It's a course of action that hasn't been taken in the movies. But as a mere human, one of your only chances of not losing against this thing is by changing his very reason for living. You must transform the nihilist through your wise words and make him become an idealist, a believer in the higher power of love. That might, of course, just get you squished into a ball and thrown off the edge of a cliff. There have been some angry people on the planet that seemed had no spots to change. The hate and fury is in the blood, in the very marrow of the bones. Ok, so what's next? In that case, as a mere human, you must try and trick Thanos. We can look at Greek mythology again and think about the word hubris. When we talk about hubris now, we mean arrogance, overconfidence, too much pride, a boastful ego, which more often than not ends with a downfall. This could be good news for you, and let's not forget that in mythologies wily humans have beaten giants in the past. Now the one thing you have going for you in your fight with Thanos is the fact that his arrogance would be so high after beating everyone everyone and fulfilling his objectives that you could not possibly be a threat to him. Now you must appeal to his ego and it's likely he'll let you close because as we said, you could not possibly hurt him in his eyes. You become his friend and tell him you're devoted to him. This is a great advantage since you might be able to get so close you could get your hands on the infinity gauntlet. Ok, so that might vaporize you, but it might not. Remember that Doctor Strange, a human, has touched one of the great stones. Get your hands on this and you might have the power of the universe. You were like a Trojan horse, your feebleness made Thanos put his guard down and because you stroked his ego, he took a liking to you. Then wham, you end his life just as he ended millions of others. One summer afternoon, you find yourself cleaning out the dusty old attic of the new home you've moved into. It's a bit out in the countryside and out of the way, but it came cheap. The owner seemed very willing to sell it. So willing in fact that they seem to have left at least half of their possessions up here in the attic. And as you're sorting through the things to trash, things to sell, and things to keep, you come across a strange book. It has a simple red cover with just a title, no author, Mr. Babadook. As you open the book, you're surprised to discover that it looks like a children's pop-up book, except there's something oddly disturbing about it. For one, it features a creepy figure dressed in a long black coat and a top hat with what looks like long claws for hands. And for the other, it comes with the following piece of disturbing poetry. If it's in a word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. You read that simple poem aloud and suddenly you think you hear shuffling of feet in the darkness of the attic. Looking up, you're startled to see the figure from the book. It's real. As it rears up its full height and displays its clawed hands, you suddenly understand why the owners decided to sell this house so cheap. Hello and welcome to another episode of You Versus. Today we're putting you up against the legendary demon of grief, the Babadook. No one is sure about the origins of the Babadook, save to say that it's been around at least since the late Victorian era, given its predisposition for the long coats and top hats so popular at the time. The Babadook could of course be much older than that, given that it seems to be mystically linked to a pop-up book that bears its full name. The first pop-up books were made in the late 13th century, and it's possible that the Babadook has been around as long as they have. However, as a demon, the Babadook is likely a far more ancient being, haunting humanity since its inception. Its connection to the pop-up book in question may just be its chosen avenue of haunting its victims, or perhaps part of some mystical banishment the demon suffered at some point in its past. Whatever the origins, you're gonna have to know what you're up against if you're in the Babadook's crosshairs. As usual, this will be a fight to the death. 
or at least a fight to banish the Babadook since it's likely that as a demon it cannot die. So what are you potentially facing? First and foremost, the Babadook is in fact a demon, which places it in a category aside from spirits, monsters, ghouls, or other things that go bump in the night. As a demon, this means that the Babadook is more intelligent than a spirit or a ghoul, and thus far more crafty and manipulative. It understands humanity in a way that other supernatural creatures can't, as it draws both from its immortal lifespan of experiences and higher intelligence, and thus knows what makes us tick and how to exploit all of our fears. Fear is important because as a demon, the Babadook is much like a spirit, strengthened by fear, and the more scared its victims become, the more powerful that the Babadook becomes. The Babadook is, however, specifically a demon of grief and prefers to target people who have been made vulnerable by deep sadness, depression, and loss in their lives. Its hauntings are geared to further deepen those feelings of hopelessness, pain, and loss until finally pushing its victims into either letting it possess them or doing great acts of violence. The Babadook has an arsenal of powers at its disposal and will prove difficult to counter. First and foremost, it has the ability to teleport at will, though it does show a preference to teleport to dark and shadowy areas as opposed to brightly lit spaces. This may mean that the Babadook is tied to the shadows of the world and can move through them freely, but has difficulty using its powers to escape in bright light. This isn't its only trick though, as the Babadook also displays a formidable talent for telekinesis, able to move objects as large as a couch with its mind. It can also shapeshift into people the victim is familiar with, or into mundane objects, though is given away upon closer inspection, so it has an imperfect talent for mimicry. Lastly, it's a keen manipulator using its ability to inflict terror on its victims to gradually break down their mental defenses until they do things that the Babadook wants, which is typically to commit violence. So you're up against the dreaded Babadook. How are you going to defeat this demon of grief? First, you're going to want to defeat its ability to randomly teleport at will through the shadows. This will be key in order to keep the Babadook from getting the drop on you, and so that you can make sure to land a killing blow when the time comes. In order to counter the Babadook's ability to randomly teleport away from you, you're going to want to get your hands on a piece of hardware like the BySight LED searchlight, which can put out as much as 6,000 lumens up to a range of 800 meters. That's half as bright as the sun reflecting off white snow, and prolonged exposure directly to the eyes can lead to permanent vision problems. With a miniature sun in your hands, you'll be able to blast away even the deepest, darkest shadows, and with the ability to flood, you'll scatter any shadows directly in front of you, leaving no room for the Babadook to hide. Of course, that still leaves all the dark areas behind you that it could try to flee to. So you're going to need something that can light up really large areas, like the rising of a second sun. And nothing can light up large swaths of ground, quite like an Aramax. The tool of choice by professional filmmakers who will need to work outdoors in the middle of the night. The Aramax is a whopping 18,000 watt light that can be hoisted up into the air on a crane or secured to a sturdy tree. With this monster light blasting your surroundings, the Babadook will have absolutely nowhere to hide. So you've taken care of its ability to teleport, leaving the Babadook with nowhere to hide. You'll have to watch out for its ability to use telekinesis to move objects around, which it will no doubt try to use as a weapon against you. But as long as you're keeping a sharp eye on your environment and keeping your head on a swivel, you should be fine. What you should be most concerned about is its ability to manipulate your fears. Like many evil creatures that go bump in the night, the Babadook is strengthened by fear, so you're going to have to keep a firm grip on what scares you. Unlike other demons or similar creatures that feed on fear though, the Babadook specifically feeds off grief as well, and fear that stems from that grief. So your next weapon is going to be to arm yourself with some peace of mind. If you're holding on to any particular pain or loss, let it go. Try to be grateful for the things that you already have in your life, and try to take joy in the accomplishments you achieve, such as the imminent Babadook kill you're about to score because you're a Zen master, and this shifty demon can't find any weak spots in your psyche to exploit. You've strip the Babadook of its ability to teleport away. You've remembered the five Ds of dodgeball and dodged, ducked, dipped, dove, and dodged. Everything it's tried to hurl at you with telekinesis. And when it tried to manipulate your grief and fear, you shut the Babadook down with a Dalai Lama-like level of self-mastery. Now it's time to go for the kill and end this death match once and for all, sending this demon of grief back to the fiery hell that spawned it. As you probably know by now from watching our other episodes, we here at the Infographics Show are fans of problem solving through superior firepower. And in this case, we have one and only one tool to recommend. A surefire way to blast this hell spawn out of this world and back into its own. The Super Soaker Scatter Blast Blaster. 
That's right, a squirt gun. Only not any regular type of squirt gun, a 22 ounce beast that can deliver shotgun like blasts of water up to 34 feet away. Except you're not going to be blasting the Babadook with any regular type of water, you're going to be using holy water blessed by a priest. As a demon, the Babadook is bound to rules of our prime material plane. If it chooses to manifest physically, that means that the Babadook took solid form in order to directly manipulate our world. Then its body would be subject to the same rules as our own bodies or anything else physical, in which case we'd recommend firepower on a level much higher than the squirt gun. However, because the Babadook doesn't manifest physically, it can't be harmed physically. That's why it needs to haunt victims in order to eventually wear them down and commit the violence it can't commit itself. So to excommunicate this demon out of our world and back to its own, at least temporarily, you're going to have to hit it with the only thing all demons can't stand, corporal or non-corporal, holy water. Water blessed by true faith in the divine is the anathema to evil, and has the power not just to hurt evil, but to dispel it altogether. With a tank full of blessed water, your super soaker scatter blaster is a demon blasting weapon that Michael the Archangel would be envious of. That is, of course, if the water you're using has been blessed by a priest with true faith, something very, very rare in our world today. Otherwise, well, you're really only going to be making a very angry demon soaking wet moments before it rips your soul from your body and inhabits you forever. How would you defeat the Babadook? Also, if you like this series, check out our other videos where we pitch you against something horrible. Go on, click the thumbnail. I'll wait.